Diuretics are medications that promote diuresis. And diuresis is the excess or increased production of urine. So in this video and the subsequent videos, we're going to discuss a number of different types of diuretics. We're going to talk about where they act and how they act in order to promote urine output. Now there's a number of reasons why we'd use diuretics from heart failure to hypertension to liver diseases and certain kidney diseases, but we'll discuss those where appropriate within this course. So first, I want to talk about the three categories of diuretics. Now, there's numerous categories of diuretics, but for you, I want you to just remember these three particular categories. Those categories are the loop diuretics, the thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics, and what we call the potassium sparing diuretics. All right, so what we're going to focus on is one at a time. So I want to first look at loop diuretics. Now, because diuretics promote diuresis, which is the production of urine, these substances obviously work at the kidneys. Now, if we want to talk specifically about where in the kidneys does urine production occur, you should know that this happens at the nephron. Therefore, these diuretics tend to work at the nephron. But you also know that if we were to draw a nephron up, that there's different aspects of the nephron. Now I'm going to simplify nephron for you. You're going to have the glomerular capsule. You're going to have the proximal convoluted tubule. Now I haven't drawn it convoluted, I've just drawn it straight for simplicity's sake. You're going to have the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Then you're going to have the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And then there's the thick portion of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. And then there's the distal convoluted tubule. And then we ultimately hit the collecting duct. And as you know, blood that comes in, each kidney has one million of these nephrons and there's going to be these capillaries that are present. Now, I don't have a red pen with me, but this is a capillary, which looks like a ball of yarn here in the glomerular capsule and that's called the glomerulus. And you're going to have blood coming in and it gets filtered into the glomerular capsule. And not just the plasma, but also what's within that plasma. So that's going to be the water, the electrolytes, the wastes and so forth. Because they get filtered through, they travel along this nephron. And if they stay within the lumen of this tube, the hollow inside, ultimately it comes out here at the end as P. Simple. We know that we filter approximately 200 odd liters of this blood every day, but we don't pee out 200 liters of fluid. We pee out about 1% of this, about two liters. So what happens? Well, obviously the substances that are within this lumen must get thrown out back into the body. So the reason why I'm recapping this for you, which is the basic uh, renal physiology that we've been through last year is that you need to be aware that when we go through the diuretics they're going to act at different parts of this nephron and they're going to throw certain substances back into the body or they're going to tell certain substances to stay within the tube. Now predominantly the way these diuretics work is by telling the sodium to stay within the lumen of the nephron. Why? Because if sodium stays within the lumen of the nephron, you should know that wherever sodium goes, water follows. So if sodium stays within this nephron, it pulls water in with it, and therefore, more urine output. That's basically how these diuretics work. But because they act in different areas, they have a slightly different mechanism of action, even though predominantly they work by keeping sodium within this tube and therefore pulling water in. So like I said, the first one I want to talk about, the loop diuretics. So hence the name, the loop diuretics act at the loop of Henle, which is this aspect here. 
But specifically, I want to talk about the loop diuretics that act at the thick ascending aspect of the loop of Henle. So I'm just going to wipe this out and draw it a lot larger for you. So you've got the glomerular capsule, you've got the proximal convoluted tubule, you've got the descending limb, you've got the ascending limb, and then let's draw the thick aspect, really large so that we can highlight what happens. The distal convoluted tubule, we'll just leave it there. Now, Remember I said, when things get thrown out, it goes back into the body. So when I draw an arrow coming out of this tubule, that's going back into the body. But because this is a tube, they're all lined with cells. So I'm gonna draw a nice big cell coming off the side of this thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, okay? Therefore, things will go from the lumen to the cell, back to the body, or from the body to the cell, back into the lumen to be peed out. And we'll highlight that. First thing you need to be aware of is this. All the cells of your nephron, okay, so all these cells, I've just blown up one here, have at the basolateral side, okay, this is the luminal side of that cell, because there's the hollow inside. This is the basolateral side, okay. They have, embedded in their walls, pumps, all of them. And what do these pumps do? These pumps will throw out three sodium, and hopefully you know the rest of it, and throw back in two potassium. So I'll just draw two potassium like that. Okay? You know that this uses ATP, and therefore it's called the Sodium, potassium, ATPase, pump, you know this. Throwing three sodium out, two potassium back in. I just wanted to highlight that to you first because all the cell types will have this. This is how we get the sodium back into our body. You can see that there. This is why sodium sits predominantly extracellular outside the cell and why potassium sits intracellular inside the cell. Now, next thing I want you to be aware of is remember how the blood's coming through and we filter all that stuff from our blood? Let's think about the ions. What ions will we filter? Well, we're gonna filter a huge amount, but let's focus on the major ones. We're gonna filter sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and chloride. There's others such as hydrogen ions and so forth, but let's just stick with those at the moment. Which means when they get filtered through, they're gonna travel through unless they get pulled back into the body, okay? So that means as they travel through, what are we gonna get when they reach the ascending, the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle? Well, we're gonna get, sodium's gonna get here, potassium's gonna get here, magnesium's gonna get here, calcium's gonna get here, chloride's gonna get here. All right, remember I said 99% of this stuff gets thrown back into the body. So let's talk about that. This is what happens normally. Well, on the luminal side of the cells of the thick ascending loop of Henle, you have a really big pump, another pump. What this pump does is it throws one sodium into the cell from the luminal side, it throws one potassium in from the luminal side into the cell, and it throws two chloride ions in. This pump is called the sodium potassium two chloride pump, or the sodium potassium two chloride symporter or co-transporter, okay? All right, what does this mean? Simple. Sodium has gone from the luminal side into the cell. Then what does it do? Well, it travels over to the sodium potassium ATPase pump and gets thrown outside. Perfect. What else happens? Well, the chloride that comes in, there's chloride channels in the walls here. And therefore this chloride will 
travel out as well. What else happens? Well, you can see that potassium's coming into the cell from the luminal side. It's coming into the cell from the extracellular fluid. So we've got a huge increase of potassium here. So that means potassium wants to get out somehow, right? The cells don't want to continually increase all this concentration of potassium. How does it get out? Well, a couple of ways. One way is that there's some channels for potassium and some potassium will leak out, but not a huge amount. The main way that potassium gets out is there's channels here and potassium. Remember, potassium is accumulating. You can see potassium coming in from the luminal side, potassium coming in from the extracellular side and increasing, 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 and potassium begins to leak into the luminal side. Okay? And so because it's increasing, you've got a huge amount and a huge amount leaking out. So you start to accumulate all this potassium because you've got a high concentration gradient of potassium here and it gets thrown out. These are very efficient. So not much potassium goes to the extracellular fluid. A lot goes into the lumen. Now, what have we done with these ions that have come in? The sodium that's come in, well, that was easy. It got thrown in through the sodium potassium 2 chloride pump and then got pumped out by the sodium potassium ATPase. Therefore, sodium's dealt with. Perfect. What about chloride? Well, chloride came in through the same sodium potassium 2 chloride pump and then diffused out through chloride channels. So that got dealt with. What about the potassium? Well, what we now have is all this potassium starts to increase inside the lumen of the cell. Why? Because some potassium is thrown in, and then some more potassium is thrown in, and then it diffuses back out again, and you've got a really, really positive charge sitting in the lumen of your nephron at the thick ascending limb. What do you think that means for poor magnesium and calcium? Look at magnesium and calcium. They've got two positive charges each. So you've got this really positive signal going on here in the lumen of the thick ascending limb. Do you think magnesium and chloride like this? They hate it. So what do you think they do? They're repelled by it and they go, oh, I'm out of here. And they just push their way through the cells and go back into the body. Same goes with magnesium. Magnesium doesn't like that, gets pushed out, goes back into the body. So, what have we done effectively? This is what happens normally inside of you and I, is that when we reach the thick ascending limb, the sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and chloride that have reached there, magnesium goes back into the body, calcium goes back into the body, some potassium goes back into the body, chloride goes back into the body, and sodium goes back into the body. Perfect, that's how we reabsorb this is one part in which we reabsorb a good number of these ions. Now, let's talk about diuretics, and let's talk about specifically loop diuretics. So the loop diuretic that we need to talk about today is furosemide, also known as furizamide. Now, how does this diuretic work? Simple. This diuretic blocks this sodium, potassium, dichloride pump. It no longer works. So think about what that means, okay? If this sodium potassium dichloride pump no longer works, it means that the sodium that comes in doesn't go into the cell, right? So that means sodium accumulates here in the lumen. It means the potassium that floats through in here doesn't go in. So potassium accumulates here. It means the chloride that comes through doesn't get to go into the cell. And chloride accumulates here. Now, think about what that means. That means that positive sodium, positive potassium, and negative chloride, now I've got a nice sort of balanced charge here. What that means is, because there's no potassium building up here, and no sodium, Sodium can't exchange for potassium, so we don't have that potassium building up inside the cell, which means we don't get that efflux of potassium into the lumen, so that's not happening. We have this nice positive, positive, negative, negative balanced charge that's happening in the lumen, which means when magnesium and calcium get here, they're not repelled. They do not jump out of the cell. 
And if they don't jump out of the cell, where do you think they accumulate? They accumulate here in the lumen of the cell, uh, of the thick ascending limb of the nephron. Now, you understand how osmosis works, so that means that where there's a high concentration of these ions, it pulls water in towards it, and this water will eventually go through the nephron and be peed out. And that's how furosemide works as a diuretic. It also means that if patients take this long term, they don't get to absorb much sodium in their, back into their body, they don't get to absorb much potassium, or chloride, or magnesium, or calcium. And they can actually be, become, over a long period of time of using this diuretic, deficient in any of these particular ions. So that's how furosemide works as a diuretic.